much uh, for welcoming me to Franklin. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come down here and see the work that's being done in this community. Um, it is really an uh, inspiration to me coming from up in the north and north area. Um, when I heard about this talk, uh, the, the idea, Steve Whitman was floating it around. Um, I thought it was going to be a wonderful event, primarily because I would get a chance to hear what Michael Phillips has to say. So I'm going to be sort of brief and open the door for his time later. Um, I also just want to give a, a shout out to Steve Whitman, who unfortunately is not here. He's somewhere in Central America in like 75 degree weather. Um, and so Steve, thank you very much for setting this all up. Um, I also want to give a little plug out to New Hampshire Permaculture Day, which is an event that's been going on for a couple years right now. There's some uh, flyers, little handouts over on the table. It's going to be on August 25th this year. Um, it really strikes me in, in some sense that this is uh, there's a lot of coincidences and a lot of um, concentric circles going on in the world of permaculture. When I first moved to New Hampshire, in 1997, uh, we were getting our um, organic certification, and there was a woman named Vicki Smith who was doing the certification. And she sort of looked over what we were doing at the Acres, and you know, it was a little odd, it was a little different. And she said, you know, there's somebody you need to talk to, and his name is Michael Phillips. And she gave us his name right off in terms of someone who was uh, in cahoots, in league with what we were doing. And you know that was nearly 20 years ago, and I am very thankful that there's more people than just uh, Michael Phillips out there now. Uh, the, the movement is really growing. Um, there's more people getting involved in different levels, in different areas. You know, so it's just not orcharding or gardening anymore. It is about community community revitalization and um, bringing our culture forward. My talk specifically this evening is going to be focused more on uh, the perennialization of agriculture. So this uh, really has to do with getting us away from the annual, uh, the, the type of agriculture where we're reinventing the wheel every year, where we're re-plowing up the 40 acres um, and trying to get us into a type of agriculture that is going to uh, perpetuate and um, grow in abundance year after year, as opposed to, like, we get, uh, like I said, with an annual agricultural system, more or less to start from scratch every year. So to get there um, is going to take a lot to get to this sort of agricultural system. I sort of have a vision of what it would look like, and uh, the vision that I have in, in my head is, so when we're driving home this evening, instead of just uh, suburban home after suburban home, the suburban homes are linked with gardens. Uh, the the um, Instead of just forest lands, we also have um, maturing forest gardens uh, along the highways. We have walnuts and chestnuts and hickory, and we have um, orchards of apples and pears and peaches. Um, basically, all, all over our developed space, so instead of the, the concrete jungle and the power lines and the, um, the superhighways, we are interlacing those with food production. And so it's uh, more perhaps like we'd be seeing um, in a style similar to Europe. I think the, um, the, the, the civilizations that have been in place longer have put a, a little bit more emphasis on this a perennialization of agriculture, um, where they're probably going wrong a little ways, is the monoculture nature of their uh, perennialization. So, in terms of getting there, you know, I think uh, we really have to take a historical perspective on um, the long the long game here. Um, in terms of this agricultural system that I'm envisioning, with uh, you know, like a forest garden that's in the process of maturing, that's a, a hundred, a two hundred year w window of opportunity that we need to get involved with. So let's take a step back and just think about how many changes have taken place on this continent in the last two hundred odd years. Um, two hundred fifty years ago, 
New Hampshire was owned by the King of England. Uh, 200 years ago, everybody was dressing up in white wigs and petticoats. A uh, 100 years ago, um, women were slaves. They couldn't vote. Uh, this is just 100 years ago. In the, in, you know, this, this period of time, um, the last 100 years, we've really shifted and maybe in some senses taken some steps backwards. Um, when you look at the national political scene, for instance, uh, around in the late 1800s, there was a whole populism movement. Um, in the early 1900s, there was a, a rather large socialist movement in this country. Um, right now, I'm reading some historical uh, a biography of Eugene Debs, and he was a, a labor leader in the late 1800s who was involved with the uh, international workers of the world. <clears throat> and uh, to just think in those terms, like as an American today, we are just not looking outward in that way. We, we are not really considering all the other workers in the world, and we are as, as equals to us, as, as our brothers and sisters. Um, so in many senses, I think perhaps we've taken some steps back in our, in our realization of, of uh, sort of where we fit in the world. I have uh, uh, um, some experiences that I'd like to share based on going out and doing speaking tour over the last two years. And sort of, uh, my talk tonight in general is very anecdotal and sort of switches gears couple times. So um, pardon me if we sort of get lost in transitions. I hope it'll all come back together in the end. The, um, when I was on tour for the book, uh, I went to a couple places to do speaking gigs. And one of the places I uh, went for tour was a place called the Stone Barn Center in uh, outside of New York City. And uh, the Stone Barn Center is very much like you would imagine um, Who's the little magician? You know, Harry Potter. You know Harry Potter? You know where he went to school and stuff like that? Yeah. So the Stone Barn Center is really it looks a lot like that. It's 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 all stone and it looks like this, you know, castle. And there's a chef there, his name is Dan Barber, he's pretty famous. And um, so we're we're at this place and we're giving lectures and we're talking to people. And we're learning about the Stone Barn Center, how it's really like a farm-to-table experience. And this is sort of, for me, it sort of really gauges where, where the stage of farm-to-table is. Because on this, on the property, you know, it's a, it's a pretty large property. It, from, from our, from touring around and so forth, it, 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 it was uh, expressed to us that really the only thing that's being produced on site for the restaurant was can't even describe how small they were. They were taking tiny seedlings, like carrot seedlings, and plating them. So it, you couldn't even hardly tell what it was, but it was like a, a, a baby, a baby carrot, baby, baby carrot. And they would plate these, and that you know this whole farm with this five-star restaurant on it that was like so so into you know local food and, and sort of this this illusion of food production on site, <clears throat> the, the sole thing they were producing and plating was these many vegetables. And so I guess uh, speaking to this, I think there's a lot of lip service right now towards the farm to table type model, whereas um, we need some meat and potatoes to it. We need some real substance to it. Um, so, so that's something I, I ran into. And then um, during my travels, I also um, rode my bike over to the fair in Maine, the, the, the um, Common Ground Fair. And uh, during that trip, <clears throat> it was really nearly 200 miles riding your bike. And during that whole time, riding through you know, beautiful terrain in New Hampshire and Maine, beautiful farmland, uh, just suburb after suburb, and there wasn't a single place that I really felt like I wanted to stop and eat. 
it, it, you know, there's the convenience stores that have the same junk food in them in every place. But all along that route, none of the restaurants really appear to me. Most of them are fast food or, you know, sort of the generic stores. But just to, in my mind, we've lost something. Um, we've lost that connection to food that is so principal and so fundamental, and it is just gone. It's disappeared. It's a, it's a ghost land of what it was. It's barns falling down instead of restaurants with open signs or farms with, with open signs. Um, when I was at Stone Barn, too, there was another a, a food critic type guy. His name's Mark Bittman. Um, uh, you probably don't know him unless you're really into this food movement type stuff, but he is, is you know, a well-known writer. And he came, gave, came up and gave a speech in which he was... Uh, he really could, in, in, in the words that he said, he, he was ridiculing um, leaders of Central America who were encouraging the people to reoccupy the land. You know, the, the revolutionary leaders of Central America. And he said, you know, the words that I say, it makes me sound like one of those guys. And I was really struck by that, that he didn't recognize that if he's saying the words that they say, he is one of those guys. You know, just sort of that disconnect where um, the, he, he just felt like um, economies or uh, places where the, the, the people were re-welcomed to, to occupy the land was just ridiculous. Like it, it, it was impossible to even make sense to him. Like it was a fallacy that could, could never happen. Um, I got an email today, uh, was today or yesterday, where it said um, that there are 100 people in this country that own 34 million acres. So, so, so one person owns at least 3.4 million acres? That's one person. Uh, so, one, so in my mind, that just is like, well, shoot. How far away are we from 250 years ago when the king owned this place? Yeah. It, it just, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be that much of a difference. I gave a talk to at um, Anofa, New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, I'm trying, all of these talks, I'm trying to, you know, poke people and prod people and sort of inspire them. And so I, I, I made a comment and I was suggesting that um, everybody that eats chicken should be involved at some point in their life in killing a chicken. And uh, it would poof. That, that, ooh, that was a tough one for some people to swallow. I mean, there, there's just this mentality that, you know, some of us are specialists. And if you're a specialist, you do specialist work, you get paid well, you can buy a chicken. But, you know, there's something wrong with that. There's something missing from that picture. Um, to take the life of another animal so 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 quickly and so um, w without a conscience at some level, without actually experiencing it at some level, seems some way just wrong. It seems unfair um, to the animal as well as to the to the to the person to to be so disconnected. <clears throat> At some level, too, you know, when we really get into, like, how we're spending our time and what we're doing, um, you know, this social media stuff is fairly recent, you know, the last 20 years or so. But apparently now we're spending up to four hours a day on social media, you know, clicking and scrolling and using our thumbs extensively. <laughs> um, it's just, if we could lose that four hours from social media, and each of us spend four hours a day on garden tasks, there would be no problem with, with our food system. And I'd probably our social lives would improve. Um, but, but it's that sort of, you know, just a, it, it's these customs and culture that, you know, it, it happens, you know. You, you wonder, like, how, how do people in Africa get in this habit of putting rings around their neck and making them, their neck stop longer? You think, oh, that's sort of a ridiculous customer. And then a person in Africa can look over at our country and say, why the hell are those people watching football every Sunday? 
you know, watching the guys crash their heads into one another as if it was sport. Um, so, so, I mean, when we look at culture and we look at how it shifts, there's, sometimes it doesn't seem like there's a rhyme or reason to it. But if we could get in there and give it a rhyme and a reason, I think that would go a long way. There was another talk that I gave where uh, I made one of these uh, inflammatory statements where uh, I stated that we should, we should um, take back the commons. And so to me, that's a, that's a fundamental that I think is, is you know, it, it's a, a shift in our paradigm, it's a shift in our understanding of, of how we view the world. And, but to take back the commons doesn't necessarily mean we go out next door and you know, we say, this is mine. But we do take responsibility for it as if it were ours. And taking back the commons doesn't mean now it's mine and I can sell it and trade it and I can, I can use it all up. <coughs> it means I own it. I, I, I have ownership of it. It means I have commitment and responsibility to love and nurture it. It's a, it's a different way of looking at the work and our relationship to this planet. So instead of ownership meaning, oh, I own this, I can, I can subdivide it, I can, I can take it out, I can sell it, it means I own it, it's mine, it's my responsibility. And it's just a different way of, of looking at things. Our, our goal is, at this point as a farmer, um, to create a viable food system and create abundance on this planet. It's not necessarily to create a profit. And I think it's the, um, unfortunately, a lot of our time and our money and our um, economy is based on a place um, called Wall Street. And Wall Street has, uh, you know, it's captured our imagination. People uh, are basing their, their retirement, their future, on these digits that are getting traded on a computer. The, and, and futures and derivatives. And, you know, economic systems that are, it's gambling. Um, but we, we base our whole reality on this stock market. Um, as a person in the nonprofit business, I, 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 the acres is a 501c, and um, it's a very interesting time to be in this world where we're really connected to um, grant-making institutions. I'm taking a little sidetrack here that I think is important. It's important for me and us to really understand um, the amount of money that has been stuffed into these foundations that holds up Wall Street, right? Let me try to explain this. When I go and apply to a foundation, say like the Byrne Foundation, it's a big foundation in the Upper Valley, you look and see where they got their money, right? Byrne Foundation, for instance, is uh, was founded by the guy that was the CEO of Geico. You guys know Geico, the lizard commercials? Do you know what Geico stands for? It was a, it was a government employee's uh, insurance company that, that was privatized. And so now it it's, was, you know, that privatization made it extremely lucrative. Um, and, you know, it's a huge insurance company. It's one of the top three insurance companies in the country. Um, so now, you know, the, all this money that was raised in, in Geico is being slowly distributed. Like, I, I'll, I'll, I'll call Ms. Byrne and ask her for a check for the elementary school. So it's just re redistributing. When I look at other big um, foundations and so forth, you look at their 990, and it'll list where they're invested with. And these, you know, these are sometimes billion dollar foundations. And it's just straight straight up NASDAQ, straight up Standard & Poor, straight up McDonald's, ExxonMobil, Gulf. This is where they have their money cache. It is gonna be an extremely good year to write grants this year because the stock market is up. Could be up about 20% at the end of the year. All these company, uh, all these foundations are going to have excess money that they need to distribute. But the reality is that 
because they hold trillion dollars of, of assets that's stuffed into the stock market, it's, they're what's holding that stock market cohesive and giving it the legitimacy that, that it has. And so take this all in the big circle, the people that like own Stone Barn Center, uh, the Rockefellers, all these old families, this is where their money is. And this is where how they are able to continue to control the direction of our society through their charitable donations. It's a big, um, it, it, it's a very interesting scenario that we're facing. For me, um, I'm looking for a way that we can get 50 million farmers on the land in this country. I think, you know, right now, that seems really ridiculous. Like, to say that maybe one out of five people in this country was a farmer on land. Seems like, wow, that's, you're, you're dreaming, Josh, right? One out of five people, 20%. Whereas, you know, 200 years ago, at least 50% of the people were farming. Now we're down to say one to two to 3% of the people are farming. How do we get it back up to the 50% or to the 20%? Um, to me, I think we need to open up some opportunities for people and start looking at different ways to, to grow up. One way I think would be great is if we gave people um, the opportunity to travel more extensively when they're younger. So I would get everybody from age 14 up a bicycle and tell them to ride wherever they liked. Go as long as you want. Go travel. And at that point, too, we'll be looking for those people from 14 to, say, age 30, because we need the labor. We need the people working on farms. So as they ride their bike down the road, they're going to come to a place, they're going to get hungry. And they're going to come to a place that's called a farm. And that farm is going to be able to, because what we do, we supply food. So we're going to give food in exchange for labor. And so we're going to develop a whole working class of people who are experiencing travel and are learning by doing from, say, 14 to 30. And then around 30, I think they should settle down. Why not? You know, settle down and have a family if you want. Maybe, you know, we sort of make it a societal norm. Uh, if you're going to have kids, wait till you're 30. Have two kids, why not? You know? Uh, let's let's get uh, let's make it sort of the norm that you know you're not expected to have 12 kids. You're not expected to have four or five. You just look into um, replacement. So two, two at the most. Have a boy and a girl, or two girls, two boys. But we'll be done. Why go further? And if you don't want to have any children, that's fine too. Um, but I think there's there's a way where we can start expressing, you know. If people have the opportunity, they have a support system that provides them with the travel and with the food and with the uh, life experiences, then they're not going to feel the, the urge or the inclination to just settle down. Yeah, you know, you know. Um, I see, you know, all of the 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 times and time and money that's invested in different ways in our culture, like the time and money that is spent right now on oceanfront and lakefront property, you know, gazillions of dollars in this country, very risky properties um, on the oceanfront, and properties that really detract from the value of the water that are on the waterfront. Um, so. You know, I think we should just probably put a halt to all this building and figure out ways to use the sacred lakes and the ocean front for, for more positive purposes than just being st st stuck in a real estate market. Um, how, do, how does all this happen? How do we go from a society that has, you know, this situation where 100 people own 34 million acres in our country and you know, there's 
houses on the beach up and down the coast that are worth $10 million where, you, you know, you look around Franklin, $10 million in Franklin, how much affordable housing could we put in? So, I mean, it, it, you know, it, and people would like to say, oh, you can't do this, you can't make these radical changes, you can't, you can't. Well, why can't we? We're a country that, that defied England, that told the king, you know, you don't own us, you can't tax us. Why can't we continue to be revolutionaries? Why can't, why, why do we have to be stuck in this modality where everything has to be just as the founding fathers laid it out? That makes no sense to me at this juncture. There was no women involved with any of this process. That's 50% of, of the people. How founding fathers were asked. We need to start over. We need, really need to take a look at, at where we stand right now and move forward. This is not about making America great again. This is about <laughs> making America great today, tomorrow, moving forward. Um, I think we've just really lost an awareness of what progress can be. Um, but in general, I think, you know, we just need to take it upon ourselves not to be bullied, not to be sort of coerced into saying that, that this is how it has to be, this is how, how it is. What I think we need to do is just think outside this box, look for all the alternatives that are out here, and really start actualizing that to me is the, the you got to put in those four hours. You got to put in those four hours a day in the garden. You got to get up off the computer. You got to uh, take a step back from um, the things that are making us unhealthy as a society and pushing into the stuff that, that, that is rewarding. Um, the food, the service to our community. I think um, for me, as, a, as an organization, what we've decided to do, T. Acres, we've been very successful at creating a sort of insular, you know, this, uh, we've created a homestead that's very self-sufficient. It, it has its own economy, you know, we have visitors all the time uh, that come, we, we, we feed them, they give us money, we pay our bills, it, it, it's working. As, as a unit. That's not enough. So what we decided to do at the Acres, you know, we spent the sort of first 20 years building ourselves up and sort of getting a handle on, on that model, that sort of insular model. And what we want to do now is really use that capacity to have an influence in the public schools. So we want to develop a, a K through 12 curriculum that the Acres can help support and initiate. So like this year, um, we're giving third graders, every third grader that wants three to five chickens, here, here's your chickens. <laughs> we don't know if it's age appropriate. We don't know, you know, how it's gonna work. The, the chickens go home with these people. What's gonna happen? Um, but we're doing it. We're buying the chickens, we're raising them up to six weeks old. And on May 27th, they're getting dropped off with the kids. We're going to see how it goes. But what I envision is something from K through 12, where each year they get introduced to a different aspect of agriculture, a different aspect of recycling, reducing their waste, reclaiming um, building materials. And so by the time they're 12th graders, they know how to milk a cow, they know how to build a house, they know how to do the stuff that we're feeling like is being lost. And so um, for me, as an organization, you know, having spent this time really focusing on within, now it's our time to, to focus outside and to really try to bring uh, the knowledge into the next generation from, from, from when they can walk into the school to when they leave the school and try to push it there. Um, so, so that's sort of the leverage point that we've identified as D acres to, to, to work on for the next 20 years. Um, I think in general, you know, what, what we're trying to, to come by is uh, a place-based diet 
in a localized economy that also has a real conscience for the, for the global scenario. So we're, we're independent in, in our economy, but we're totally with the, the rest of the people of the world. And so it's sort of this consciousness level that we need to get to. Um, for me, you know, when we really get into this, the status quo and the situation as it stands, I think we need to recognize that it's our problem that we created it, and we're all beneficiaries of it as well. And so to, to try to figure out a way to detach from this reality and move forward will be a very painful process. It will be a process with a lot of confusion, uh, a process with a lot of failure. But I don't want to go have to live on Mars, people. I like Earth super. I think it, I will try 99, I will try 999 things to try to find the answer. So that's, I think, the, the project at hand, and I think the work that needs to be done. And so I appreciate you all coming tonight and listening to my ramble. And I encourage you all to take whatever steps you can to try to improve the situation that we currently face. Um, I look forward to hearing what Michael has to say. Um, if you have questions for me, perhaps the best thing to do is wait till the very end. Does that work for people? And we'll let Michael go ahead and get up because he's, he's got some very informative information.